how to excel at your internship, what you already have an internship. I'm going to give the phase one now, which is we are going to talk about what is an internship in the first place, why you should do one, and how to get one, and like everything about internships, basically. Um, yeah, so. Uh, so there will be a bias towards like overseas internships, but it doesn't really matter because almost everything I'm saying right now like applies to almost all local companies and overseas companies. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, so who am I? Uh, my name is Vishnu, and uh, I'm a final year student in computer science in NUS. Uh, I've interned at these three companies, Twitter, Apple, and latest I was at Uber with uh, Chen. Spent my last summer there. And uh, all these internships were in uh, in the San Francisco area. Okay, so let's go on to what is an internship in the first place. So an internship is basically uh, it's usually 12 to 14 weeks long, and you're basically working with the team, and they basically treat you like a full-time employee, but you're just there temporarily. So you could treat that as like temporary work, where you you are given all the normal responsibilities of a full-time engineer at most companies. And you're you're just there for three months, so it's like like it's on trial. So you're trying out the company, and the company is trying you out, just because you're a, you're a really capable university student, and they might want to hire you in the future as a really valuable employee. You work with a team. You are never working alone. You're always attached to a team, and the team usually does real work. Like it's you usually a team that's working on something that's really exciting inside that company. That was my team at Uber. Uh, my team was called Driver Driver. Uh, we many went through many um, reorgs. I think it was, by the time I left, it was called driver engagement. When I joined, it was driver experience, then it became something else, that was driver engagement in three months. Um, you're all, you also have a mentor and a manager. Your manager is just like your boss, and your mentor is just basically a guy that guides you through everything that you're doing. Uh, most companies have that as well, a mentor who's just a fellow engineer in the team, and a manager who's usually the manager of that team itself. And you also usually get to do an intern project, because uh, the companies are really trying to get you to join. So the companies want you to do something that's really valuable for the company as well. So whether you can go back to school and show up with your friends by telling them, hey, I built this and I built that. So you usually get this really well scoped out project where you start the project, you scope out the project in the first few weeks, you build it, you test it, you ship it, and then by the end of your 12 weeks, they're usually done and you get to ship out something that you can call your own. Yeah, uh, you also get to do real work. You are doing actual real work here. You're not just bringing coffee for someone. That's not how most tech engineers work. You're actually doing real work. You're working like just like a normal full-time engineer and doing the real stuff. And at NUS, you can also get free credits for doing this. Um, there's this thing called SIP. Uh, if you do a three-month internship in the summer, you get six MCs. And if you do a six-month internship, you can get 12 MCs. And you can apply that for overseas internships as well. So you can just get like free credits and graduate earlier if that's what you want. It's awesome. So. Um, Okay, so now you know what's an internship, but why should you do an internship? But why? But why? Okay, so why should we do? I have a few reasons. The first reason is, is that you get to do something impactful while in school. That's the word there, while in school. And um, basically, you get to, since if you're working at this like Silicon Valley type of company, or even companies in Singapore like Vicky, Grab Taxi, and Garena, these companies, they own products that are used by millions of people almost at the same time. And you get to impact these products. You get to make like actual technical decisions on the things that they do, and you get to work on these actual products. I'll go through a few examples on what I got to do in my three internships. Okay, I'm going to skip Twitter because I'm no time. I'll just go straight to Apple. So when I was at Apple, uh, I got to work on Xcode. If you don't know what Xcode is, uh, so Xcode is the app that you use to make apps. A bit confusing, yeah. So all the iPhone apps that you see in the app store are made using this thing called Xcode. And uh, yeah, so I was with the team for six months. I did a long ATAP internship. I skipped school for a while. And uh, but at my time, I, 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 while I was at Xcode, I got to work on a bunch of things. Last year when I gave this talk, I couldn't tell anyone what I did because it, it's Apple and you can't tell anyone what you do because of how secretive the company is. But now I can because of the fact that my feature is released. And this is what I got to work on. So. Um, I worked on this in 2015, and in 2016, in Xcode 8, they released it. So I worked on the first prototype of Xcode editor extensions. So in Xcode 8 now, there's a feature where uh, they are finally like, uh, bringing like, plug-in like, like functionality to the IDE. Previously, you couldn't do that legally. And I built, so, so my project for the first six months there was to build a, pro a prototype to show that this thing can even work. 
and it like shipped as a real feature now that probably millions of users can use. I think uh, like Xcode 8 is still in beta, mm -hmm. but once it goes out of beta, like anyone can build an editor, an editor extension and ship it. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Uh, I also spent uh, my last summer at Uber, worked on two big features there. I was on the driver experience team, so we were in charge of basically all the drivers on the platform. There are millions of drivers that drive on Uber every single month, and uh, we were in charge of like building features for them, the app, how the app works, how Uber Pool works, all those kinds of things. So one, of, one the feature that I worked on was um, this feature called Stop New Request. It's a simple feature if you think about it. So the problem is imagine Uber Pool, and if you're in Uber Pool right now, you could pick up passenger A, then pick up B, and then drop off A, then pick up C, then drop off B, and go on forever until the car runs out of gas or the driver faints and then he gets an accident, right? So the driver never gets a break because we, we as in the, the Uber, uh, the Uber a dispatching system is constantly giving them trips that's like optimized, and the driver never gets a break, potentially. So I just built this simple feature called Stop New Requests, where the driver at any time could go into the app, and once the driver feels like, hey, I've had enough, I want to refill my, my petrol, I'll just go for lunch, go in the app and hit Stop New Requests, and the Uber like dispatching system would stop sending them new requests. And this feature, I think by the time I left, was deployed to 200,000 drivers. By now, it should be deployed to all of Uber's drivers. So these are the kind of projects that interns get, not bringing co coffee to someone. Well, the driver gets coffee now, but I built the feature <laughs> to help them get co coffee. Yeah, so those are the kind of projects that you get to do. It's like real world stuff that actually, that project hasn't shipped yet because when you're working on such a high level project, you want to test it a lot. So I'm sure they're going to test it for at least a year or so before they ship something like that because you need to make sure that the driver doesn't say something and then the action doesn't happen then he gets into a real accident. So these kind of features you really have to test them. You also get to learn a lot at these internships. Like the people who work here are extremely smart, right? Like the people who work at Facebook, Google, all these companies are extremely smart. And just by being in the same environment and talking to them and interacting with them and just seeing how they write code, you learn a lot. Like you, you get a lot of perspective of what you're doing in school and you get to apply that in your real life. Um, you become more attractive to future employers as well just because in your resume when you say that, oh, I, you, like, if a company is trying to hire you and they realize that you have passed the engineering bar to work at Google, that's a pretty good sign for the company to hire you. Because Google has already done the work for that company by saying that, hey, this guy work, has worked for us. And you also bring a lot of context back to what you're learning in school. Because when you're in school, it's a really, really good thing to do internships because you spend like one year in school, I think about nine months in school and then three months in internship. You gotta really apply what you're learning in school. So the next sem, you have more context on what you're doing and you understand why you're doing what you're doing in school. Okay, you also gotta discover what you like. I mean, uh, most people in university, they only get to work once they've graduated. Like, and the thing is, if you do internships, you get to like, it's a three month trial, right? It's, 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 it's a two way trial. You get to try the company, the company gets to try you. So is software engineer, is software engineering really what you want? So you get to try that out. Are you inter interested in mobile stuff? Do you want to make apps? Are you interested in infrastructure, front end, design? All these things, right? You get, if you start in your freshman year, you get almost three internship slots by the time you graduate. And you get to try out like all these kinds of things and build your interest. You basically get to work even before your peers have graduated and try out what you like. It's a really good thing. Do you even like working in a tech company and things like that? Uh, I'll just go through some examples of um, what happened at each company. So when I was at Twi Twitter, like this really interesting thing they had was, they were just a very transparent company internally. Like they, want, they were okay with every employee. I think there are 3,000 something employees when I worked there. They were okay with all employees knowing everything about the company. So every Thursday, they had this thing called tea time, where the CEO would sit there, and everyone in the company is invited to watch and attend this event. And they'll basically talk about everything that went good and bad in the last week. Good press, bad press, and it's fine because this is a confined space. Like everyone who works here cares about the company and it's fine to talk about confidential stuff here. And that was like really interesting. Like the, like the company is so big and I was really surprised to see that they're still so open. Um, completely different from how Apple works, by the way. Just because of how secret the company is. No one knows anything. Uh, half the employees, their bookmarks is like macrumors.com because even they need to read that to find out what the old company is doing. Uh, they don't know what's happening outside their own team. That's just how the company works. That's the best way to keep secrets, right? You only expose your secrets to exactly who you need to know. Them. But that's just how like, Apple works, and they are successful in their own way. Uh, next. Oh yeah, this was something else that uh, Twitter encouraged Wallace. They're my manager. 
th this was a roof deck, by the way. This is like their lunch area inside the, the, the building. They encourage, like my manager at he encouraged me to have lunch with someone new every day. Just approach someone. You can use our internal chat system to chat up with anyone. Just say, hey, can I have lunch with you? And it's not someone I even know, and it's something that I just did. And just to meet these people and just to have them in your contact list, it's a really, really cool, 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 and, like a cool and important thing to do. What's next? Oh yeah, internships are also fun. So this is away from the technical side. If you're doing an overseas internship, it can be anywhere. Like there are people in this room who have done internships in Australia, in London, in Switzerland, in the U.S., East Coast, West Coast. It doesn't matter. Like. The people have done internships anywhere, but as long as you're doing it outside of Singapore, you're going to travel a lot. And the good thing about internships is, and I found this really valuable, after Friday 5 p.m., the company doesn't own your time. Friday 5 p.m. to Monday, whenever you start your work, you have no homeworks, you have no assignments, you have nothing to care about except your own enjoyment. Like, you have nothing to care about. Especially when you're an intern, you have no responsibility, so it's fine. <laughs> right? So you're, you won't be set like on call, you won't be the on call engineer or anything. So the weekends were extremely fun because I. Every weekend I could do something for fun. Like fly around, go meet for events, go for tech events, go for hackathons and things like that. It's very different from school life, where you're always worried about the next test or assignment. Uh, like unless you're me, who doesn't care about anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, you also get to meet people from, uh, from other colleges, which is important as well. So some, some examples of the things that I got to do that were fun. Uh, I was at Twitter during the 2014 World Cup. I think I gave the story last year as well. So in, when the World Cup was happening, they need to make sure that Twitter works during the World Cup because when someone scores a goal, everyone in Brazil, I think it was the Brazil World Cup, would send like, goal! <laughs> and the tweets would go up by like, spike up by like 50% for that second. For that few seconds, the tweets sent in that second would go up by a, by a 50% for the second after that. So the really cool thing is, these are like, like engineers, and they're watching the World Cup to make sure that Twitter is alive during the World Cup. Because <laughs> we have to, because when there's like a penalty shootout, that's where the most excitement happens. Like everyone's like, oh, the referee is cheating, blah, 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 all these kinds of things, right? So and the really cool thing that we found out here is, like ESPN, when you're watching ESPN to watch the World Cup, it takes about four seconds to transfer from the feed from Brazil to the US. But Twitter is real time, it happens in milliseconds. So we saw goals happening before we saw it on ESPN. So we, we could watch the charts that showed live tweets per second, and then like we could see spiking up, and then we knew, okay, this is either a goal or a referee or someone kicked someone or someone got a red card, <laughs> and then we'll see it on screen. Like three seconds later, we'll see it on the screen. That's because like Twitter is just so real time and TV is slow. Um, <laughs> Another thing I got, got myself involved in is um, this, when Twitter, they are long, when they launch a new product, they have this thing called a war room. And I got to sit in, in a war room. This is basically a room where, when they launch a new feature, they just want all hands on deck. They want everyone who's involved in the product to be in one room. The PR people, the engineers, the designers, the data scientists, and everyone just so that when we launch it, we make sure that if something is wrong, because when you, when you launch something, this is the first time your product is going to be used by millions of people. Right? So they want to make sure that, that everything's going to be done on time. There are like stats on the screen and stuff like that. This, this is like really like interesting stuff that I wasn't exposed to. I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, I'm also going to travel a lot. This is one of the random trips that I took and a random video that I took. The US is very big, so if you're in the US specifically, there's a lot of things to do in the US. Um, you could be there forever and always be traveling and seeing something new every single weekend. Oh, my next one, yeah. Uh, when I was at Apple, I also got to attend WWDC. So when I was at Apple as an Apple engineer, they gave me the rare opportunity to attend the conference representing the company itself. So that was really an awesome experience. Um, yeah, so these are the kinds of, like, you, you get to go for con con conference as well. If a company's hosting a conference, you should get to attend that. They at least give you a chance to attend and see how it's going. Because, the, as I said, an internship is always a two-way thing. You are trying to convince the company that you should work for the company. and I mean, you, the company should hire you, and the company is trying to convince you that you should work for us. And the selling is happening both ways. You would see when we go to the perks section later on. Uh, another thing, uh, this is that's Tim Cook on the left. Uh, we had internal concerts at, at, at Apple. They happen every month because they own iTunes, the biggest music store in the world. So they have contact with every single musician. So I think we had Pharrell come down, Adam Lambert. They basically come in and give pri private concerts to Apple employees only. And uh, that's Tim Cook. I have a video of him dancing, but I can't show that in case you guys record it and it goes somewhere on the internet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Pulse. Uh, 
like for US internships, they paid really well just because of competitively, competitively, like when one company needs to pay in some rate, like every company tries to match that figure and you end up getting like a really good rate. And like other perks are really all awesome as well. Like some companies like Facebook, for example, they give you free housing. That's on top of the really good pay, pay, pay that you get. Laptops are default. I shouldn't have shown the number first, right? <laughs> uh, like, like everyone, you get a laptop because because of like um, like data privacy issues. They want to make sure that all your company work is done on a property that's not yours, so that when you leave the company, like you don't get to steal anything for yourself. You get a bunch of free shirts. You also get discounts. That's the Apple Watch. Um, I was at Apple when the Apple Watch launched. When the, when the Apple Watch launched, they gave it to everyone for fifty percent discount, which is quite significant. <laughs> One more slide is uh, this guy uh, who works at Berkeley. He made this, uh, so basically he did this random survey of all the interns in the Bay Area and this is the, this is how much they're paying for this summer. So for like, from the summer from May to August this year, this is what they're paying right now. And most companies are like in this room, in this ballpark. And the reason why they do it is just because it's really competitive and it's really hard to get this job and they just want to make sure that you have an awesome time and you will join the company afterwards. Like the best ones, they even give you free housing. So, uh, yeah, that's how it is to do an internship in Silicon Valley. All right, next slide. Oh yeah, Uber credits. Yeah, and Uber I Uber credits as well. So all my rights are free. What's my next slide? Oh, food. Yeah, food is extremely important to me because I care a lot about food. And uh, free food in almost all the companies, except Apple, because they don't have a culture of free food, but everywhere else is free food. Uh, and the food is awesome, right? Because the way these companies work is, we want to make sure our engineers are as productive as possible. So anything that helps with productivity, or anything that helps to make sure you stay in office for that extra minute, is good for you, and we will give it to you for free. Because in, when you don't have free food, you always have, like at 11 o'clock, you would leave the office, Go out for lunch, pick up your friends, and then by the time you're back, it's like 12:30, and you're wasting 19 minutes, like 19 minutes doing nothing. But when you offer them free food, they just go out for go for lunch in the in like the fifth floor. They have lunch for 10 minutes, and they're back. So from company point of view, it makes their engineers more productive. So that's like a two-way thing. But the food is really good as well, so you never want to leave. And they give you all three meals, so why leave? <laughs> so you may think if you have all three meals, you could also like basically live there, right? You can because of the shower. Uh, this is Twitter. They had a really good shower, and they don't encourage you to live there. But the main point of it is, like, after your gym, you could gym somewhere. Like, Twitter has its own gym. And then after the gym, you can just go there and have a good shower, and then go back to the office. Everything's provided, towels, so blah blah blah. So only to bring it yourself. Uh, yeah, rooftop garden. I already talked about that. The rooftop garden. Okay, so uh, the whole point of that was to sell you to do to to tell you why you should do an internship and uh, why it's important to do one in your summers and not waste your summers doing like, like nothing else. So how can I get an internship? Let's go to the next step one. We have done the why and uh, what. Let's go how. Zero to one internship. So this is the process to get an internship, right? You have to apply, the most important step. And um, you, when you apply, you usually use your resume. And if they like your resume, what your resume says is they will contact back to you and then once they contact you, you would have some phone screens. This is, I'll go into some details about what a phone screen is. And then optionally, you would have an on-site. An on-site is basically when they fly you into the office, or in Singapore, you go to the office and you actually have an on-site interview. For internships, that though, doesn't really happen. For full-time, you always get an on-site, but rarely for an internship. And then you get an offer. And then you get to choose to accept the offer or not accept it. So step one. Uh, most people don't even reach a step one. Like, if you do a random survey of most people in, 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 in like, associate, and you ask them, why have you done an internship? Then you ask them, like, have you done step one? They just say, no, yeah. Like, I've not even got to the applying stage because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I'll get rejected. And that's the most important thing, right? You need to go through that fear of rejection and just tell yourself that I'm ready, if you think you're ready, and you must be ready, and just apply. And just see what, ha what, ha what happens, right? Uh, these are the common, common reasons why people say they're not ready. My resume is not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for interviews. I need more time to study for my interview. I don't know when. I really want to work at this company. What if I screw up? I applied to a company already just waiting for a response. I mean, 
all these things are valid excuses, but they're also invalid at the same time, right? Because uh, if you want to get what you want, you just, you just have to try hard for, for it, and you can always get something if you try hard enough. I'll just go through some of these examples. My resume, my resume is not ready, so not a valid excuse, go away. Um, <laughs> the thing about, I, I'm not ready for interviews, okay, that, that, that's valid, and we'll go through some tips about how to become ready for these technical interviews and how you can practice. There are a bunch of resources online, there are thousands of questions online, you can't practice yourself. And I don't really know, I, what, I really want to work at the company, what if I screw up? That is a semi-valid excuse, but the, what I want to tell you is most of these like, interviews, they are tweaked in a way where they want to make sure that they are reading out false positive. Okay, whatever the one is where you get the wrong person in, right? Uh, false, and false, false positives, right? False positive. So the, the interviews are tweaked in a way where even if you make a single mistake, that is enough reason for them to not offer you, uh, like not offer you an offer to join the company. That is because of the fact that if a, like if a bad team member joins their team, and usually these teams are very small, you could really affect the company in a really, really bad way. So they want to make sure that everyone who joins the team is super high core quality. And the engineers, they know that. They are hiring boards, they know that we reject more people than we accept. And because of that, they're completely okay with you trying again. But almost all these companies, if you get rejected once, they complete, they're completely fine with you trying again because they know that we, there is a, like, like our system of accepting people is not foolproof. We, we reject a lot of people that we think are competent just because they made one tiny mistake. And we, we just want to make sure that they're always competent. So it's fine to try again. I think that Google internally, they allow you to try you, that like you, can, you can try at Google three times before they like help ban you forever. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. I don't know why it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next slide. Uh, oh, I, I think the no meant that those are not valid reasons. Uh, so how do you apply, right? So uh, there are many ways to apply. The most basic way is every single company has a job site. And once you know this fact, like every company has a job site. If you go to google.com slash jobs, I think we'll end up there. Every company has a job site. And in every job site, you can go online and apply and submit your resume. They might ask for a co co cover letter. You usually don't need to fill that in. Usually your, your, your resume should be enough to explain like, who, who you are. And other than the job site, there are career fairs. Uh, this is something that Singapore, like like NUS, is getting much better in. Like recently, the last two years, I've seen many more like big name tech companies representing themselves in, in Singapore. Like in the career fair that we just had, PayPal was there, Uber was there, Google was there, uh, Facebook was there, and they're all hiring for the Silicon Valley positions. Actually, they were not they were not hiring for local positions, and that's a good way to get recognized because when you go to the job sites, there are hundreds of, 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 of applicants that go in. When you go to the the career fair, the chances of you getting your resume recognized is slightly higher. There are also like info sessions and tech talks. Usually when a company is coming to NUS to give a talk, it's usually a recruiting event. They don't try to say it that way, but it usually is. Right, when I'm, I'm sure, I, I didn't attend the Google talk, but I'm pretty sure that was a recruiting like event as well, because they're opening a Google engineering campus in Singapore, and they're trying to get people to join them. And if you go for these sessions, they might be like a recruiting pitch at the end. You could talk to the, to the engineers and see how you can get a job there. And the last one is referral. So that's the, uh, usually that guarantees you the highest chance of getting an interview. And to get a referral, it usually works in the process where you know someone has already worked at company X. And that X and that person can, um, like really knows you as a good person. Like you're really quite close to that person and that person can vouch for you. And that person would be able to tell company X that, hey, this is someone that I think we should bring in. He's strong enough and I think he's competent to be in our team. Why don't we interview him? And the reason why that's really well recognized is, from a company's point of view, if person A has passed my interview and he's an awesome employee in my company, if A says that B is good, obviously B should have some value there. Right? That's a really good like positive, si like positive signal there. Because person A works for me, and A told me that B is good. And you should try to interview B. So usually when you refer someone, you're almost definitely guaranteed an interview, at least. Uh, you're not guaranteed an offer, you still have to go through the same interview process, you don't get any special treatment, but you usually at least guarantee that interview if you get a strong referral. Oh yeah, so when should I apply? Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that most people get wrong. So this is very dependent on where you're trying to apply. So if you're looking for a Singaporean internship, Grab Taxi, Wiki, Car Carousel, any of those companies, you could apply like next year and that's perfectly fine. You could apply like in February, March for a summer internship and that's fine. 
But the problem is, and most people don't know this, which is why they miss out, for a US internship specific to a Silicon Valley internship, they start their application process very early. This is because of how many people are applying. The moment summer ends, which was this, which was August, in September they've already started filling in their positions for next summer. And the timeline is usually set in a way where by December or January they have filled up all their spots. And then when you realize that, hey, in February I realize I want to do an internship Silicon Valley by the time it's too late. Because in Apple, for example, I know for a fact that by December they close on all the slots. And I think Google should be like Jan or something like that. So this is the most important thing to know right now, the fact that you should be applying now, basically. Like this month, next month, and November is like the best time to apply to these companies if you're interested in interning in Silicon Valley. All right, so step two. Um, once the, you do apply, what happens after that? So um, you get a... Challenge, I think you're going to go through that afterwards. So I'll just quickly go through the slides. Uh, yeah, there's nothing much. Step three is uh, you get a technical phone interview. I'm not going to go through this because uh, Julian is going to go through this in the next section of this talk. And yeah, you're just going to, we'll be going through all these questions later on, soon. Uh, there might be multiple rounds of technical interviews. Most companies for an internship role, they have two, two to three. That's what you usually is. Some, like I thought people have had to do like three or four rounds before, but that's completely fine. It's very different from a full-time interview. For a full-time interview, you usually have like between four to six uh, like interviews. Uh, yeah. What is the next step? Step four is the offer. We're not gonna talk about the offer here because you're just, you're just gonna accept it, so. <laughs> what is there to talk about? Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk about what actually happens at the technical interviews, and I'm going to pass on to Chuan. Yeah, I'm just going to ask, this is eight really. That's fine. Are they okay with staying? Yeah. Uh, I'll ask them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so our event is supposed to schedule at eight, and I want to like, respect all your time. So you've got to go, right? Go ahead. If not, we after this session, Vishnu continues sharing about some tips, and then we would want to have a QA and a in case you have any questions. So. If you want, I can go through like how to, you know, do technical interviews. Or otherwise, if you have any questions you want to ask, do we want to open it up for? I think we can continue. On. Continue. Anyone on? Leave? Anyone need? Okay, so if you have to go, we're gonna continue on. I'm gonna make it as quick as I can, and then if you have to leave, just uh, feel free because it's uh, eight thirty. Have the screen. Have the screen. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um. Technical interviews. What, what, what happens during technical interviews? Usually it's about 45 minutes to one hour, and then it starts off with a very soft introduction. The interviewer will kind of like introduce him, him or herself, talk about the role, uh, maybe talk a bit, a bit about the company, the culture. Um, and then after that, there will be the actual technical interview, the actual technical question. Um, it could be more than one, depends on the how, how well you do, how quickly you do it, um, depends on the, the scope of the question or so. And then after that, you will most likely have time for Q&A with the interviewers. So you can ask questions about the company or the, the, the role or whatever you want. Um, so technical interviews can happen either in person or over the phone. So for my experience, uh, it has almost always been over the phone call uh, with a shared like Google Doc instance, uh, except for Stripe. So Stripe is pretty special. One phone call when I was in Singapore and they were in SF, and then they decided to uh, fly me over for an on-site interview. And then uh, on-site, we have uh, three rounds of technical interviews, whiteboarding and stuff, and one did, uh, lunch with uh, a manager. So for internships, uh, most likely, they will not fly you, but Stripe was, uh, Stripe just switched, uh, of course, they don't care. Uh, which is really nice. Um, so these are, these are kind of questions uh, at the beginning of the technical interview where the interviewer would ask. So these are very soft, you know, tell me about yourself kind of questions. Tell me about blah, 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 where blah, blah, blah is something that they find in your resume. For example, if you say that, oh, I worked on this school project where I use a certain programming language or I use a certain framework, I use a Rails, then they might, okay, what do you like about Rails? You know, what challenges have you faced when you're using Rails, things like that. Um, or sometimes they like to ask about, uh, they like to ask about like, um, any, what's your biggest challenge? Is the mic open? I reduced the ball. Oh, okay, so I'm too loud. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's very subtle. Um, so, like, they, they like to ask about what's the biggest challenge you have faced in a certain project or assignment? I'll speak, I'll speak softer, though. Yeah. Okay. Is it too soft now? It's too soft now. It's, okay. <laughs> it's very hard to please, Vishnu. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, other kind of questions. This, this usually happens in the, HR phone call. So from my experience, right, 
first when you apply, they accept you, the recruiter would call you first and then ask you about like, you know, what kind of roles are you interested in? What kind of passion do you have? Do you know about the culture of the company? Do you know about the company's core products? Things like that. So to make sure that there's like a little culture fit. Uh, so yeah, these are these are questions that you should be prepared. You should know the answers to if you are even interested in a company. So questions like you know, do you even know about the company? Like if I apply for Twitter, I better know that Twitter what's Twitter's mission, you know what's their goal, what's their core product, and what kind of other products they have, and uh, be have, be very confident why you want to join the company. Um, and and then after the soft introduction, right, where they ask you, you know, what what uh, how, tell me about yourself, will be the actual technical questions. So uh, these are sample, these are very easy, you might be laughing like, oh, this guy got to Google because he can add two hexadecimal numbers, like, now this is, this is warming up, right? You know, the first question, they don't want to scare your, scare the hell of you, right? They ask you a very easy, uh, quick, like, you no know, five, 10 minutes kind of warm up question, get you, get you started, right? Cause you might be, you know, just wake up because of the time, time zone difference. Um, so some sample question is like, you know, they explain very simple concepts, like what is a deadlock? You know, you should be able to kind of explain in your own words what a deadlock is. And this is where my earlier point about paying attention in school comes in uh, very handy. Um, so a uh, sample JavaScript question, like, you know, what is this? You know, the, this keyword is a very special thing in JavaScript. Uh, depending on the calling context, it could be a different thing. So why I mention this is because if you put in your resume that you know JavaScript, then make sure you know JavaScript, right? Don't put in Java because you took this module that taught you Java for like one week. And then you're like, oh, or you use like, uh, Haskell, you went through the tutorial and like, oh, I know Haskell, and then the, the interview asks you about Haskell, and you're like, uh, I don't really know. So be very confident, whatever you put in your re resume, better have evidence to support your claim. Um, okay. And uh, some other kind of like technical questions that doesn't involve much uh, coding, but requires a bit more uh, explanation would be things like, you know, tell me what happens after you type www.google.com into the address bar. Yeah. This is a very, very, very interesting question because you could take this in so many directions based on your interest. Okay, let's see your interest is in networks. You know, okay, you can talk all the way from www.google.com HTTP, right? You can talk about HTTP, how the protocol works, and how HTTP is like layer, layer what, layer five or seven of the networking OCPI or whatever shit protocol, and then like, you can talk about HTTP over uh, know, TCP or whatever, and then uh, how the PHP internet protocol works, and then you can go all this, uh, how names servers or DNS, uh, all this. Routing, whatever, then go all the way down to hardware, how your routers work, uh, Wi Fi network. So many things. But if you're interested in, uh, let's say, browsers, you know, you can talk about how the browser interprets this, you know, you can pass this to regex, whatever, send to this network call, then there's uh, this event loop that runs in the background, and like, you know, I don't know, VA engine, and you could like compile, and just just that compilation, you know, it's whatever you want to talk about. So this is a great chance to showcase your talent and passion. I probably rented a lot and none of you understand what I say, but like the, the point is that this kind of questions can and uh, will pop up, so it's a good chance for you to showcase your, your, your talent. Uh. Um, and then this is the this is a meat of the interview which will take out like a good 20 to 30 minutes uh, depending on your, your ability to solve these kind of questions. So uh, look, look at the first question, it's a very simple, find an element in a softened pivotal array. And here is where it, it gets it gets interesting, right? You know, uh, so the f first thing is is like uh, you want to find an element. Like, what well, what's the easiest way? You know, you always want to think about the most simple solution to the problem first. You know, what's the simplest problem to find an element in a sorted pivotal array? Just iterate through the array and then check if your element is the correct element. Uh. But then, what is the complexity? O n right, right? Because you have to iterate through n elements. So this is where like, you know, school actually matters. You are expected to know your big O notation. You are expected to be able to quickly um, find out if a certain algorithm is of a certain complexity, both in terms of time and also space. Okay, um, so, so this is where you explore the question a bit more. Okay, why does the question say that it's a sorted pivoted array? Okay, if I give you a sorted array, what is the fastest algorithm you can find a certain element? Binary search, all of you are getting to Google already, okay. But, so, so, so it's good for you during an interview to like, oh, okay, if I have a sorted array, I can use binary search, and then there's O of log n, right? But what if it's pivoted? What is the difference between a pivoted and a non-pivoted array? And then like you, okay, you probably think, okay, maybe I need a binary search that's kind of modified, because now I cannot assume that everything is in a sorted order. I have to kind of like figure out if I'm in the pivot, and then if I'm in the pivot, I gotta go a certain way, because now it's pivoted, you know? So these are the tricky questions, not, not say tricky, but like they won't give you very obvious direct questions that you have done in school. They'll add a little bit of twist to it and you are kind of expected to still be able to do it. Um, 
These are uh, uh, more rare questions. Uh, I got this at Stripe. So questions like, you know, design a certain system. So uh, one of the sample questions would be like, you want to design a system that can collect metrics, right? You want to collect metrics from all your instances. You have like thousands of instances running on AWS and you want metrics, you want health status checks on, on all these uh, systems. How would you do that? And then you might think like, oh, it could be a simple, you know, HTTP request, polling, but then how do you make it scalable? What if you have tens of thousands of instances, where are you going to store this? How often do you want to query? Is it every second, every three seconds? How long do you have to persist this data for? Is it one week, one month, one year? And then are you going to store it in the machine? What if the machine runs out of RAM? What if the machine runs out of hard disk space? Where are you going to archive it? It's a lot of things to think about. That's why you should explore more breath, right? Uh, you all look very confused. Sorry. Um, this is me. Oh, okay. So, so now you kind of have an idea what happens during a technical interview. Um, how do you prepare for the interview, right? Um, the interview is really a test, okay? The interview is a test where you showcase to the interviewer that you have what it takes, you have what they're looking for. And like being in Singapore, right? All your study in Singapore, you've taken countless of tests, right? From the day you were in kindergarten, you took a test. Until now, you are still taking a test every three months, or more than one test every three months. So practice, you know, test how you prepare for your O levels, A levels, you do pass your paper. Same thing, algorithm questions, data structure questions, go online, find questions, do it. Practice, get comfortable with it. So the next time someone asks you, how do you find an element in a sort of pivotal array? And you can say, oh, I use a modified binary research that looks at where I am in the pivot and then decide to go left or right. Simple, right? Once you know it, it's very easy. And once they give you another question that is kind of similar, you can like, oh, I know how to do this. So maybe I can modify it so that like I can get the correct solution. Um, the other points are kind of like relevant for any kind of interviews that you go for, right? You want to be fresh, be prepared. Even though it's a phone call, they don't see your face, they don't see that you haven't brushed your teeth or washed your face in the morning. You want to feel fresh and sharp. When you dress sharp, when you feel sharp, you will perform more uh, confidently, you will perform better also. Um, yeah, in general, you, you have time for questions for the interviewer. So uh, prepare things to ask the interviewer. Questions that are generic, maybe like, uh, can you describe to me how uh, your day-to-day -day life is like? You know, find out a little bit more about what they spend every day doing. Um, so these are some resources where you can go to practice. Um, Popcoder, LeetCode, HackerRank, they're all really good. LeetCode is super good because they have a lot of questions and they also have a lot of solutions. So they actually tell you uh, many different ways of solving the same question. Um, and then HackerRank is really good because it's like an in-browser editor and a compiler. So you can actually run your code and make sure that you, your, your stuff actually works correctly and they have uh, test cases for you to check your results or so. There's this book that's really, really, really good called Cracking the Coding Interview. If you go to the NUS Library Portal and you look for this book, it's actually available but it's usually on loan by someone. Okay, this book is really good. It goes through uh, how to prepare for interviews, you know, basically like this presentation, but expanded into like hundreds of pages. And it gives you a lot of sample questions from all the different kind of topics. And a lot of those questions are actual questions that companies have asked. So it's all very uh, anecdotal. It's all very, very real. So if you read that book, you, uh, you will feel more prepared and be more confident about things. Um, this last point, may or may not be relevant, okay? But it's still pretty important for you to be comfortable writing code on paper. Because if you get an interview where you're whiteboarding, right? means you're writing code on a whiteboard. It's a very strange thing for you to do. You know, you always write code in an in a, in a IDE or in, on, your, on your computer, right? And then like, if there's an error, it's an undefined variable, you get red squiggly lines uh, screaming at you, right? But if you run a whiteboard and you get something that's like bad syntactically, you're just gonna get your interview mocking you, right? Your interviewer is gonna be like, oh, this guy doesn't really, this guy or girl doesn't really know his or her stuff well. So it's important to write code on paper, write code on whiteboard, practice the, the medium that you are you're doing. So uh, if you if you know that it's gonna be a phone interview, then you should go and try and have a mock phone interview with a friend or someone who has done it so that you can like try it and see how it feels. Um, Uh, so, at a very high level, the technical interviews achieve certain goals, right? Besides assessing whether you have the technical abilities, it's also a way for the interviewer to see if you kind of like fit in. You know, if you are in general a nice person to work with and if like, you know, you would be a good colleague. Of course, they don't want like, you know, weird, like crazy people, kind of like strange-ish, you know. Uh, everyone is kind of strange in a way, but like not too strange. Lah, huh? um, Okay, yeah, so in general, they want to see if you are nice enough for them to want to like, sit beside you and work with you. And uh, this, this, this is about during the actual interview, whether you're on a phone call or on-site, think before you, you speak, 
don't be like me. Usually I speak before I think. That's why I speak so fast. Um, so you want to process a question. Let's say the interviewer tells you a question. No, think, put a question in your head for a while. Think about it. Look at all the keywords. Okay, we we'll go through exercise later. But the example on the binary, uh, the sorted pivoted array. So it's very important that you saw the word sorted and you saw the word pivoted. Because if you miss either of these keywords, your solution will turn out to be either completely wrong or too slow or yeah. So uh, clarify any doubts you have. So like, if you are not very sure what it means by pivot, uh, is it a right pivot? Is it a complete mirror image pivot? What kind of pivot is it? Clarify, ask questions, uh, ask, ask your interview questions. Cite like examples, you know. Oh, if my array is uh, one, two, three, four, five, if I pivot it at the fourth element, is it a uh, five, one, two, three, four, or is it a uh, five, one, two, three, four? There's only one option for that, okay? But I like, clarify, uh, the main thing is clarify. Um, and articulate your thoughts, especially during phone uh, phone interviews, because like I said, you they don't see your face, right? Facial expression is a super important part of your communication. Body language is like what sixty percent of the, the communication. So when they don't see what you what your body language is, they don't see your facial expression. They have no idea whether you are like furiously thinking, you know, or are you just like completely dumbfounded? Because to them, it will appear the same thing: silence on the other end of the line, right? So try to um, articulate your thoughts, right? If you're thinking about, again, the binary search, you'll be like, oh, okay, if I have a sorted array, I can use a binary search, and that's like log n, that's really quick. But then now I have a pivoted sorted array. So it kind of seems like I, will, I can still use the binary search because a portion of the array is sorted, but not the entire array. So maybe I need to modify this in some way. Like, that's exactly how I would go on with the interview. Like, I would think out loud, you know, whatever is going on in your head, think out loud. And then I like, try and vocalize it to your to your interviewer. Uh, this is like a sample uh, question that you might get, and then like you can go through how you would do this. So, uh, question is: Write a function that removes duplicates from a list. Simple, right? And then you start typing JavaScript. Right? Function parentheses list and uh, curly brace, close curly brace, and then like, what's next? Before you even type any code, right? What's your first step? Clarify, right? Do you have, is this question ambiguous or not? Ambiguous, okay? So write a function is like, okay, it's not ambiguous, write a function, right? Okay. Removes duplicates. Okay? What does it mean to be duplicates? Maybe me and you have different ideas of duplicates. Maybe I think that if I have a list of one, 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 and I remove duplicates, one is a duplicate. So I remove all the ones. And then my result is an empty list. But maybe the interviewer was thinking, remove the duplicates but keep one of it. Remove any duplicates. So if I get a list of one, 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 and I remove duplicates, I have, an, uh, I have a list of just one element, which is a number one. And these are completely different results, right? One is wrong and one is right, and it depends on what the interviewer wants. So it's very important in this case to clarify what do they mean by remove duplicates. And actually, even more fundamentally, a list, okay? You know it's one list, right? But what's in the list? Is it um, strings? No, is it ints? Is it more list? Can the list be arbitrarily nested? Is it certain classes? What is it? You know, if you don't know what is it, what it is, how do you check for duplicates? Like there's no equality, right? If your list can, if your list is like JavaScript, you can complain, uh, contain in strings, objects, other lists. Then uh, what is the notion of equality? So these are things that you would want to clarify with your uh, interviewer. And once you clarify, then um, and you're clear that what 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 happens. Uh, you can sort of like kind of, kind of ask like, okay, so let me confirm. If I have a list of ints, okay, that's what you want, and I have the integers one, one, one. Is it one or zero, uh, no elements? And then once the interviewer tell you that okay, the correct answer is this, then you have like a base case to work with, and then you can start like writing your your function. Um, okay, so obviously your your, your code should compile, whether it's uh, in the editor, you know, Google Doc or, or on the whiteboard. You should be pretty OCD about your code. You should treat it as like, you know, apply all the skills that you learn in all your CS mods that has to do with like proper software engineering techniques, which includes proper variable names, you know, don't go crazy with like var, i, j, k, l, you know. Uh, proper meta names, comments if you need them. Um, one very good tip is start with pseudo code, right? In tandem you learn, I might you might have learned that, you know, you sometimes you write comments, pseudo code, and then you start to like flash things out and replace them with actual run, running code. So that's actually a very good technique to help you like um, 
build the skeleton of your solution and then slowly fill in bit by bit. And it's actually very helpful because one of my experience interviewing was um, I started with zero code and then I ended up not having enough time to implement. So I had this line of zero code that said like, oh, I should do this, but I never really implemented that and I ran out of time. But like, I knew that I had to do it. So the interviewer knew that I knew how, I knew that I had to do it, but I didn't have time to write the solution. So to the interviewer, it might be like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing, but you just didn't have time. And if you give him four or five more minutes, you'll be able to do it. So it creates kind of like a little false illusion that you know how to do it. You know? <laughs> it's a little trickery there. Uh, don't do it too often, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a good step, you know? Because going from no code to running code is very difficult. You know? If you have a step in between that has like non-running code, but has the actual logic or algorithm, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to move from, uh, from step A to, to, to the end. Um, and then testing. So once you write your code and you're like, oh, okay, this, this, this code should work, I think. Try, try it, try in your head, be your own compiler, right? Or interpreter, you know, run through your code, give sample inputs and like try to uh, list out the state of the variables at each step. So if let's say you have an array, right? And then you are iterating through the array. So you have an index i or you have an element n that represents the element in the array. So you'll be like, okay, on my first step, the element n is uh, the integer one. And then like, on the second step, the element n is integer two. And then like, keep doing this, work it out in, in your head, write it as command, and then it can be useful for, for, for test, test cases. And it shows the interviewer that you are pretty serious about this and like you know how the code works. You don't even know how to write code, but you actually know like, how the whole thing is running. Okay, so now vision. Right, so I'm gonna quickly close out this talk with um, some tips. Just a chance. Uh, um, okay, let's go on to my quick tips. Yeah, the first tip is uh, grades don't matter as much as you think. So, uh, you you guys know I've worked at these three companies. Um, the immediate question is: Is my GPA four point nine or is it four point nine eight? Uh, actually, none of them have even asked me for my transcript. None of these companies have ever asked me for my transcript. It, some companies still ask, but like, so for the companies that I apply to, they, they don't even have proof that I'm an NUS student. They just believe my resume. Uh, and that's fine, because what they're looking for is someone who's capable and someone who has worked on like, things, that's outside, uh, things that are outside, uh, outside of school that proves that you are a competent person. Grades don't really show that because getting an A plus, there are many people in the school that get an A plus and graduate with a really high GPA. But what, it, what, what does it actually prove? It proves that you're smart in exams, right? But it doesn't actually prove that you can be a person who works at Google. And yeah, so no one has ever looked at my grades. That's exactly the point I wanted to bring across here. So, um, school is still important though because what you learn in school is the most important thing to learn in school is how to learn. And that's a really, really important skill. And the most important skill to have is um, to learn stuff well and fast. To give an example here, when you're working, when you are going through the Facebook interview, Facebook doesn't expect you to know everything in the world because Facebook is a really, really complex company. There's so many things happening. In fact, when you join Facebook as a full-time engineer, it takes you three months to even learn how Facebook works. They have this boot camp that lasts three months. And it takes three months to even learn how the technology works. So you only get to pick your team after three months. That's how complex the company is. And when you go for an interview, they aren't expecting someone that knows everything. The, the interviews are optimized to find out someone who can learn quickly and, and fast. Which is why they give you like this kind of, kind of like teaser brain, like these kind of really like somewhat hard questions, but that you've ne never seen in your life before. But the whole point of that is to see and test you when you're given a problem that you've never faced before, how are you going to think and solve on the spot? Because when you work at a company like Facebook, you're always seeing problems that no one else has seen before, right? Because Facebook, 1.7 billion users, they're gonna hit like two billion users soon. They're gonna like hit problems that they've never seen before. And they want engineers who can fix this kind of, kind of, kind of problems. When you're faced with problems, how are you gonna solve the problem? That's what they are, they are actually looking for. Uh, hack on side projects. So one thing that I always get is my resume is empty. I mean, I have done like some school projects and stuff. How can I improve my resume? This is the first thing I tell them. Work on stuff that's outside of school just for fun, right? There are so many things that you can work. You can make an iOS app to fix this problem. You can make a website to do this. Just build random side projects just for fun. Whatever interests you. If you're, in, if you're interested in picking up a new language, just pick it up, make something, pub, publish it online. And these are things that you can add on your resume just to show that, hey, I'm someone who's, who's, who's interested in all these things. 
and I'm a really cool person as well. And also, if you publish them like open source on GitHub, that's also a way for recruiters to see that you are someone who's awesome, right? If you have a GitHub profile with lots of projects, and all these projects have lots of stars, that's an awesome good signal to show to these companies as well. And they can just see your code right there, there itself. Keep improving. So uh, it's really hard to, I mean, if you look at most, it, 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 it's somewhat hard to get an internship, especially an overseas internship if you're in your freshman year. Uh, most companies, they only try to take in people in the second and third year, but you should still try, as I've always been saying. But if you don't get an internship, it's fine. You can always try for a local internship, and even if you don't get that, it's fine, because you should tell yourself that I can always get better because I just had an interview and I filled the interview and I'm going to get better for my next interview. And if you don't get an internship, spend this summer making sure that next summer you will have an internship. And you can always be improving that way. And if, if that's what you want, you can always get that. And you can also do stuff like read articles. I'm sure you've heard of Hacker News, right? Like Hacker News is an awesome way to just be up to date on what's happening in the tech world out there. What's the latest, tech, like, latest technologies, technologies out there? What's the new JavaScript framework of this hour? There's a new JavaScript framework like every hour. So what's the latest one for this time and all those kinds of stuff. Yeah, and so make your summers count towards next year's application in case you don't get one this summer, and that's fine. Don't accept no for an answer. Um, like I said, these companies, they're optimizing to make sure we don't get any false negatives. So they do reject people who are really, really competent just because they made a small mistake, and that's fine. You should just try again and apply to more companies and just try your best. For my first internship at Twitter, when I was looking for internships, uh, internships at the time, I applied to 17 companies, and uh, six, 15 of them ignored me, and uh, only two of them replied, and only one of them gave me an interview. So only, like, I basically had only one chance, and that chance like, it luckily worked out. Another story I have is like I really wanted to work at Apple, so Apple's a company that I wanted to work for like, almost nine years now. And I've always wanted to work for them just to see how it's like to work in the company. Uh, in the last years, I've applied like four times. Always, I com get completely ignored. And uh, I don't know why, because I'm not from Stanford or MIT. And my resume just gets ignored. And that's, but it didn't really stop giving up. And I was always looking for, do I know someone who works at Apple? Can I get in through someone? And this is what I actually did. So this is the story of how I got into Apple. Um, one day, I used Twitter a lot, and I saw this tweet, this random guy, um, he's, he's actually an engineering manager in the, in the Exco team, and he tweeted saying, the Exco team is hiring, like, apply here if you want to work at Apple. And then I saw the tweet, and I just sent him a reply saying, is your team looking for interns too? And because of that reply, he found out my email address through my Twitter bio, he sent me an email saying, hey, sure, why didn't you send me your resume? And just because of the fact that my resume was sent to an actual engineer, he referred me through the internal uh, referral system, and I was confirmed an interview, and through that interview, I got into the company. So there are many ways to get in. You, you can hack your life in many, many ways, and this is a hack as well, trying to get into a company just through internships. So many ways to get what you want. This slide, I'm just going to show it one more time, just because of how important it is. If you're interested in the Silicon Valley, the best time to apply is now, right? September, October, November, December. Then by the time it's December, most of the companies will stop taking an applicant. So best time to apply is right now. And uh, I think that is uh, it. Chenya. Yeah. Do you want to Q&A first? And then Chenya is here already. OK. Yeah. We are going to go to one more talk. Uh, Chen Yang, he worked at Google Zurich, which is in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk about what it's like to do an internship. In